Hi guys, Rex here. Are you new to solo gameplay and on Showdown? Here are 10 tips to help you improve. Number one, must have solo traits. Trait selections can make a huge difference in Hunt Showdown. While traits are important for any player, solo players rely entirely on themselves, and you definitely need every advantage you can get to survive. With recent changes to traits specifically catered to solo gameplay, you can now get that advantage that just might be enough to help you clutch those tricky fights and come out on top. I recommend you take these traits in the following order whenever possible. The most important trait is Necromancer. Is this trait, when equipped on the solo hunter, allows you to revive yourself after you die. As a solo player, it doesn't take much to get sent straight back to lobby. The Necromancer trait will often be enough to give you a second chance, especially during chaotic teamfights. I rarely ever enter a solo lobby without this trait. Every self-revive with the Necromancer trait burns a health bar, which means you can revive more times with small health bars as opposed to large ones. I therefore recommend respecking into small health bars only, which can be done from the menus as seen on screen. Keep in mind though, that every death following a self-revive counts as a normal death and will negatively impact your MMR. It is recommended to limit the amount of self-revives if you're trying to maintain your rank. The second trait I recommend for solo gameplay is Resilience. This trait affects how much health you can recover when you revive. And yes, it does work with Necromancer self-revives. This means you can revive yourself with full health, which significantly increases the chances of succeeding with a self-revive, even if your body has been trapped or if someone is watching it. Being able to tank a shot after reviving can make all the difference. The third trait I recommend you take whenever possible is called Magpie. This trait is very useful and only costs one trait point. When you play solo with Magpie, you gain 10 seconds of special dark sight when you pick up a bounty and you replenish two seconds every time you take a clue or loot a dead hunter, which is twice the normal amount. When you pick up a bounty token with this trait active, you will also gain 5 minutes of stamina, antidote, and regeneration shot effects. I'll get more into depth about these effects later in this guide. With a recent patch, you can now respect traits for free. This is massively useful in acquiring some or all of the solo traits every time. Legendary hunters come with 3 random traits when recruited, and oftentimes these are high value traits worth a lot of trait points. Respecking these traits will give you the points you need to assign the solo perks and increase your overall chance of success. Each trait you respec will give its full value in trait points minus 1. For example, fanning costs 8 trait points to assign and will give you 7 points back if you respec it. Number 2. Other recommended traits for solos. The following traits are very impactful for solo gameplay and are recommended to take once you have assigned the 3 traits I mentioned earlier. Doctor, Physician and Frontiersman. When combined, these traits increase the medkit healing value, healing speed and medkit charges. The Frontiersman trait will also give you additional charges on all tool items like flooring axes and traps for instance. Serpent will allow you to grab clues and bounties from up to 25 meters away, and with recent changes this now has twice the range if you're a solo player. Serpent is a great way to snatch a bounty that hasn't been picked up yet, or grabbing it from a dead hunter without putting yourself in harm's way. In general, this trait is a fantastic option for solo players as it allows you to take less risks overall and increase your survival rate. Pack Mule is another great trait for solo players, as it allows you to replenish your tools and consumables quicker by gaining two tool or consumable charges every time you loot a toolbox or a dead hunter. Finally, Lightfoot is a fantastic trait for solo players, as it allows you to jump, vault, and climb quietly, which can make a significant difference in many situations. Not only does this perk prevent you from getting hurt as easily when you move around in the bayou, but it will also allow you to sneak up on unsuspecting enemies, for example by climbing up a ladder silently. There are many more traits to cover, but overall it comes down to playstyle and preference. The ones that I have mentioned are in my opinion the most important ones, and usually the ones that I prioritize. Number 3. Weapon choices and combinations. As a solo player, you will be outnumbered in most fights. Because of this fact, weapon choices are important and will certainly have an impact on your success rate. While in theory anything could work, I recommend choosing weapons that have a decent ammo capacity, decent damage and fire rate. You should also consider the composition of your loadout. Let's say you play solo versus trio for instance. Most of the teams you play against will consist of 3 players, and you will not have a lot of time to deal with the threat once the shit hits the fan. If your loadout of choice in this scenario is a sparks rifle and a sparks pistol, the odds are against you as both weapons require a reload between each shot. Make sure to include at least one weapon in your arsenal that has a quick rate of fire and will allow you to keep up the pressure when you have to. Another thing to consider is whether you go loud or quiet. As a solo player, taking silent weapons will often get you an advantage, as you will oftentimes be able to take multiple shots and possibly landing a kill without revealing your position. Weapons such as the hunting bow, crossbow or any silenced weapon works well in that regard. The final thing you should keep in mind is the overall effectiveness of your loadout. As a solo player, you do not have the luxury of a well-rounded team arsenal. Your loadout should ideally be effective on all ranges, or at least not too limited. Oh, One example you'll see me run a lot is the hunting bow and a sniper rifle. This allows me to dominate in close quarters with the bow, but also pick kills and keep pressure from afar with the sniper rifle right. when needed. The more you limit yourself, the rougher the experience will be. Point. Number 4. 
Tools and consumables. When you play alone, you're always one mistake away from losing your hunter. Your tools and consumables are there to help ensure that doesn't happen as easily. Personally, I always run the following. The knuckle knife is a fantastic all-round melee weapon that will allow you to deal with players and most AI effectively. The dusters on the knife works really well for emulators, and the stamina consumption is fairly low. You can also quickly kill armors with a combination of two light attacks and two heavy attacks. Goes without saying, but a medkit should always be brought, as it is a replenishable source of healing and even more potent when combined with the traits mentioned earlier. I usually bring a concertina trap, as it is useful for blocking entrances and preventing revives on both team players and other solos. This is, in my opinion, the highest value trap for solo players, but you can experiment with other traps such as alert trip mines to see what works best for you. It is worth noting that two alert trip mines will set enemy hunters on fire when triggered, and these traps can also be used to trap explosive barrels. The final tool slot is open for whatever you prefer. I often run decoy fuses that help me create distractions and make unexpected plays, or I'll take something like a throwing axe or a flare pistol. This is mostly preference. Alternatively, you can take a poison trap to combine with the concertina, which makes for a great death trap that will usually kill anyone who isn't running an antidote shot. Which brings me to my next point. 4.5. Syringes aka shots. I always bring the following shots in every single solo game, with very few exceptions. One large regeneration shot. I pop this shot before entering combat when possible, or at the earliest convenience if I find myself in a fight and haven't had the chance to use it yet, such as when someone gets a drop on me and I didn't get time to prepare. One large antidote shot. This will effectively make you immune to all poison effects, which includes the effects from poison ammo that prevents healing and will impact your hearing and vision. The shot also makes you immune to poison clouds from hand crossbow poison bolts, poison bombs and poison traps. Finally, you will be immune to getting poisoned by hives, high bombs and leeches summoned by meatheads. Overall, this shot has saved my life more times than I can count, and I see absolutely no reason not to run it. I usually pop this shot at the very start of each round, as the duration is 20 minutes. You'll often find smaller antidote shots in your matches to add to this effect. The following two shots are situational, but I bring them most of the time. One large vitality shot. This is a great mid-combat healing item, as it replenishes all of your health quickly without limiting your movement as much as the medkit. The reason why I say it's situational is because it technically only outperforms the medkit until you take the traits previously mentioned in this guide, Doctor and Physician. Once those traits are acquired, the vitality shot is not strictly necessary and can be swapped out for something that complements your playstyle or that offers more utility. If you like to play close range, you could for instance take a frag bomb, or you could take a sticky bomb for easier and quicker boss kills. Alternatively, a fire bomb would offer great utility in allowing you to burn dead hunters and forcing their teammates out of cover. One large stamina shot. At the current time, I basically always run this shot. While it is rather expensive, it offers 10 minutes of guaranteed stamina boost. Having stamina is crucial for both effective movement and dealing with bosses effectively and quickly, and as a solo player, time is of the essence. I would advise you to always bring some source of stamina, and this shot is therefore situational as you could choose to take the conduit trait instead. With the conduit trait, however, you do risk getting a single boss map and having that boss be killed before you can pick up multiple clues, effectively leaving you with limited or no stamina boost. I generally pop my 10 minute stamina shot at the start of the match as it allows me to move quickly and pick up clues, but you could alternatively save it for later and use it as you see fit. Number 5. Legendary Hunter Skins It is no secret that some Legendary Hunter Skins in Hunt Showdown are more camouflaged and harder to spot. The best example as of right now is probably the Headsman, which is borderline invisible in certain situations, such as in dark maps or when he's sitting still in a dark corner. In the past, playing Kane was widely frowned upon as he blended in far too well with the environment, but that was until he took a shower. I haven't heard many complaints since then. If you're playing solo, getting every advantage possible is advised. Think about which legendary skin you choose, because it will have an impact on how easily you're discovered, and in turn your survival rate. Some other popular legendary skins for solo players include Felis, Prodigal Daughter, and The Reptilian, all of which can be purchased at a 10% discount in the Crytek store with code REXNER. You can find a link in the description, and each purchase supports my channel. Number 6. Making the oh, first shot right. count. Since you will almost always be outnumbered, making the first shot count is crucial. If your first shot is a kill, you're effectively increasing your chance of success by reducing the fight to a 1v1 situation if you're in duos, or a 2v1 situation if you're playing trios. On the other hand, if you miss your first shot and reveal your position, you suddenly find yourself both outnumbered and your position compromised, and the odds are most definitely against you. I recommend thinking carefully about the first shot you take if the situation allows it. You do not have to take every shot, and sometimes being trigger happy will cause more harm than good. If you're feeling confident that you'll be able to either insta-kill or quickly drop a player, go for the initiation but do take note of your position and available cover. You need an escape route if it doesn't work out. Alternatively, if you're not feeling confident that you will be able to land a kill quickly, it is oftentimes better to reposition or wait for a better opportunity. Number 7. Oh, don't move too fast. Might be my chance to Pushing now. too early is one of the mistakes I find myself making fairly often. As a seasoned player, I usually move quicker than the other teams, which means I end up getting sandwiched at a boss compound. 
Let's say someone kills the boss very early in the match, and I immediately beeline it for that boss. I arrive at the location and initiate a push against the team inside. In this situation, it's just a matter of time before the other teams show up, and you either successfully push inside and kill the bounty team, or you find yourself in a very tricky situation. Unless you are a very aggressive solo player like me, I recommend slowing down a bit and allowing the other teams to navigate the map. This way you will find yourself being the bread and not the baloney in this metaphor. Another thing to consider is that your resources are limited when you play solo, and each fight will wear you down. By letting the other teams initiate the fights, you are saving your resources while they are spending theirs, and you are more likely to come out on top. Patience is a virtue. Number 8. Duos versus Trios I often get asked the following questions. Do you play duos or trios? What are the main differences between the two, and what do you recommend for beginning solo players? Well, let me answer those questions. Do I play duos or trios? I generally always play solo versus trios, but when I started out I usually played duos. Before the addition of self-revive with the necromancer trait, playing trios was simply too brutal. It only takes a bit of bad luck to be sent back to the lobby, but self-revive has effectively made trios viable for most Holy experienced shit. solo players. I also prefer playing versus trios because it provides a bigger challenge and requires more game sense and map awareness. In other words, putting all my abilities to the test. He's burning. What are the main differences between duos and trios? The short answer is that duos are generally easier but far more chaotic, while trios are more difficult but more predictable. It is worth mentioning that the skill level of duo players will oftentimes be higher as the MMR modifier for duo gameplay is lower than it is for trios. While duos may be more skilled on average, you are dealing with one less player in most teams, which in my opinion makes it easier overall. As you may know, each match can have up to 12 players. In duos, this means at least 6 teams, but more cool. if there are solo players in the match. In trios, you will typically see less teams, as most players are playing in groups of three. Because there are typically more teams spawning in different locations in duo matches, you are far more likely to run into players early in the matches, and the fights will typically be more messy as more groups push in shortly after the fight starts. Later. In trios, you are facing tougher fights, as you will usually be outnumbered 3 to 1, but the chances of other teams being nearby and interfering with your fight is much lower. It is also much easier to predict player movement in trios based on what you are hearing and what you are seeing on the map. What do I recommend for beginners? If you're new to solo gameplay, I recommend playing duos because of the reasons I previously mentioned. While your opponents are likely to be a bit more skilled and possibly more coordinated, you're dealing with less players in most of your fights, and if you initiate well as previously discussed, you could find yourself in a 1v1 situation a lot of the time. I see trios as a natural progression once you feel like you're mastering duo gameplay and want an extra challenge. There is no right or wrong, however, and I would recommend you try both modes to see what works best for you. 8.5. Beware of solo players. Solo players have an MMR modifier when they queue into a game. This means that most players you meet in your solo games will be at a lower rank than you to make up for the difference in team sizes. But what about other solo players? You probably guessed it. They are in the same boat as you and are typically more skilled than the team players in your match. I always play more carefully when I suspect an enemy hunter is playing solo as I know that they are very likely to be more dangerous. Number 9. Zoning. You have probably heard the term, work smarter not harder. This applies to solo gameplay as well. Sometimes all it takes to win a fight is playing smart and positioning yourself well. If you can control the battlefield by placing tactical traps and entrances or moving to an area where it's hard for a team to push you in a coordinated way, the odds are in your favor. Try to avoid getting surrounded and play at your own terms. Impatient team players will often end up pushing you one by one and that usually doesn't work too well for them. Backing off and setting up an ambush is not a viable strategy if holding your ground is too risky. Number 10. Read the map. Haven't moved yet, right? Learning how to read the map and everything that is going on in the match is crucial oh, to your yeah, overall success. Me. Listening for they're audio leaving. cues, paying attention to clues that have been taken by other teams, and tracking the map grayout areas are some examples of ways that you can read the map or and so make decisions think. throughout your matches. This is not specific to solo gameplay, as it is just yeah, as important for team leaving. players, but acquiring this skill set will most certainly head. help you in any case. You are playing solo after all, and you can only rely on yourself. <gasps> Why not give yourself the best odds possible by knowing when or where to expect other players, learning how to position yourself to set up an ambush, or deciding which side to approach a boss compound from. Reading the map is probably one of the hardest skills to acquire as it generally just comes with a lot of experience. But the more you focus on learning and the more you pay attention to the details, the quicker you'll improve. I have other guides on my channel covering some of these topics and I plan on making more in the future. Number 11. Follow Rexner on YouTube and Twitch. I post frequent solo versus trio content on YouTube, and as a solo player with well over 2000 hours of solo gameplay experience, I should be able to answer most questions you have during my live streams. If you have any questions or topics I did not cover in this video, please let me know in the comments below. A huge thanks to my Patreons for supporting the content and my goal of going full time as a content creator. You guys are making the dream possible and I really cannot thank you enough for it. If you would like to support my journey, head over to patreon.com slash rexner. I would also like to thank Dragon Phoenix for valuable feedback and input related to the production of this video. 
If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe as there are more similar videos planned for the near future. I stream live on Twitch at least three days per week, so head over to twitch.tv slash and take part in the live action and ask any questions you might have. Thank you so much for watching.